This video is an introduction to macroeconomics. The introduction to macroeconomics includes an overview of macroeconomics, the study of the economy as a whole, and how it differs from microeconomics. First, we can differentiate between macroeconomics and microeconomics. Let's begin by looking more carefully at the difference between micro and macro questions. Micro questions will be questions such as, should someone go to business school or start a new job? Another question in microeconomics might be what determines the salary offered by Citibank to an individual, a new Columbia MBA graduate. On the other hand, macroeconomics is going to look at questions such as how many people are employed in the economy as a whole. Another macroeconomic question might be what determines the overall salary levels paid to workers in a given year. Continuing the idea of macro versus micro, micro question might be what determines the cost to a university or college offering a new course. On the other hand, a macro question would be what determines the overall level of prices in the economy as a whole. And when we mean economy as a whole, we can have this situation where price of one sector is rising, such as housing sector prices rising. At the same time, other sectors of the economy prices are falling. For example, the cost of computer technology falling. When we say we want to know what is happening with the level of prices in the economy as a whole, we have to take all of these sectors into consideration to determine what is happening with prices. A microeconomics question might be what government policies should be adopted to make it easier for low-income students to attend college. A macroeconomic policy question might be what government policies should be adopted to promote full employment and growth in the economy as a whole. And the reason for this, two of the macroeconomic goals of the U.S. government are full employment and steady growth. The third is level prices. That prices should be rising but not too rapidly. Turning our attention to another microeconomic question, what determines whether Citibank opens a new office in Shanghai? On the other hand, macro is going to determine the overall trade in goods, services, and financial assets between U.S. and the rest of the world. This is a comparison of U.S. exports and U.S. imports. And this is tracked in the balance of trade. So to recap, microeconomics is going to focus on how decisions are made by individuals and firms and the consequences of those decisions. For example, how much it would cost for a university to offer a new course would include the cost of the instructor's salary, the classroom facilities, the class materials, and so on. Having determined the cost, the school can then decide whether or not to offer the new course by weighing the cost and benefits of the decision. Macroeconomics, on the other hand, examines the aggregate behavior of the economy. For example, how the actions of all individuals and firms in the economy interact to produce a particular level of activity as a whole. For example, the overall level of prices in the economy, how high or how low they are relative to the prices last year, rather than the price of a particular good or service. The level of overall prices in the economy rising is referred to as inflation, and the level of overall prices in the economy falling is referred to as deflation. Macroeconomics as such examines the behavior of the economy as a whole. The behavior of the macroeconomy is indeed greater than the sum of the individual actions and market outcomes. An example of this is known as the paradox of thrift. Ask yourself, is it a good idea to save? If you or your business are worried about possible economic hard times in the future, would it not be wise to prepare by cutting spending and increasing savings? 
The consequence of this cutting spending and increasing savings, the reduction in spending depresses the economy. As consumers spend less and businesses react, by laying off workers. As a result, incomes fall. In economics, we use the variable Y to stand for income. When incomes fall, as a result, families and business may end up worse off, i.e. have less income and less savings than if they hadn't tried to act responsibly by cutting their spending in the first place, and hence the paradox. So as a result, we find that in macroeconomics, the behavior of the economy as a whole is greater than the sum of the individual actions and market outcomes. We saw this fully with the onset of the Great Depression. Prior to the Great Depression, the economy was believed to be self-correcting, that problems such as unemployment are resolved without government intervention through the working of the invisible hand. But with the onset of the Great Depression and the continuation from 1929 to 1930, 1931, 1932, 1933, 1934, 1935, into 1936, and on. For another 10 years, economists began to see that the economy did not appear to be self-correcting, that the problems were so deep and prolonged that the macroeconomy was not recovering. And in 1936, John Maynard Keynes published a book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. According to John Maynard Keynes, Keynesian economics, economic slumps are caused by inadequate spending levels, and they can be mitigated by government intervention. Government intervention can take the form of either monetary policy or fiscal policy, and this government intervention should take place when economic slumps are particularly deep and prolonged, or in the case of economic depression. Monetary policy is defined as using changes in the quantity of money or the alteration of interest rates in order to affect overall spending. Fiscal policy uses changes in government spending or changes in taxes to affect overall spending. This last story is a story about why George W. Bush wasn't Herbert Hoover or why Keynesian economics is not particularly democratic or republican. Herbert Hoover did not do very much to fight the Great Depression because classical economics or economic conventional wisdom at the time dictated that government take a hands-off approach to the economy. In other words, laissez-faire, or French for leave it alone. Leading economists at that time, including Joseph Schumpeter, offered similar advice. Quote, remedial measures which work through money and credit policies of this class are particularly apt to produce additional trouble for the future, that the solution would be worse than the problem at hand. And so let it alone, let the economy self-correct. On the other hand, under George W. Bush, in the 2004 economic report of the President, it was stated, quote, strong fiscal actions by this administration and the Congress, together with the Federal Reserve's Stimulative monetary policy, the report declared, have softened the impact of the recession and have also put the economy on an upward trajectory. End quote. This was following the shortest economic recession on record, the recession of 2001, where fiscal policy together with monetary policy were employed to increase real GDP per capita, or the aggregate real GDP per capita, or level of aggregate output per person. The boost in the economy given by fiscal policy and the Federal Reserve's monetary policy efforts to cut interest rates reduce the severity and duration of the 2001 recession. In the economic report of the President 2011, we can examine income per person, which is a measure of economic growth. From 1820 until 2011, we can see the steady increase in income per person as a measure of long-run growth, or the sustained upward trend in aggregate output per person over several decades. This differs from short-run alterations of real GDP, which we examine in the next video, the business cycle.